we have a crisis in the world, tremendous crisis, and also crisis in our consciousness, in us. I see the urgency of change, radical revolution, mutation in the mind. I see it. It is necessary. There is complete quietness of the mind, and that which is silent has vast space. Only then that which is nameless comes into being. This is Urgency of Change, the Krishnamurti podcast. Seeing the whole structure and nature of dependence and how it makes the mind stupid, dull and inactive. Seeing the totality of it frees the mind. Hello and welcome to episode 114 of Urgency of Change. Season 3 of the Krishnamurti podcast continues with the format of extracts carefully chosen from the philosopher's talks. Each weekly episode focuses on a theme explored by Krishnamurti and the aim is to represent his different approaches to these universal topics. This week's theme is dependence. Upcoming themes are pleasure, values and the mind. This is a podcast from Krishnamurti Foundation Trust based at Brockwood Park in Hampshire, UK. Brockwood is also home to Brockwood Park School an international boarding school offering a personalised, holistic education for around 70 students. It is deeply inspired by Krishnamurti's teaching, which encourages academic excellence, self-understanding, creativity and integrity. Please visit brockwood.org.uk for more information. You can also find our daily quotes and videos on Instagram and Facebook at Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, which helps its visibility. This week's episode on dependence has five sections. The first extract is from Krishnamurti's second talk in Sanan, 1967, titled We All Depend on Something. We were saying how important it is to be completely free from the psychological structure of society. That is, to be completely out of society. To understand the problems of the social structure of which we are part, we need a great deal of energy, not only to understand them, but also to be free from them. We need (coughs) considerable energy, vigour, vitality, I think that becomes very obvious the more one sees how complex society is, how complex the individual that lives in this society, the individual who is part of this society, the individual who has created this society, the individual whose psychological structure is essentially that of the society. Now, to really understand the problems which each one of us has in relation to society (coughs) and to their problems of relationships in that society, for we have only one problem, really, (coughs) that is the problem of relationship in this social psychological structure. 
To understand and to be free of this, these problems, we need a great deal of energy. Not only physical energy, not only intellectual energy, but an energy that is not dependent on any motive. on any psychological stimulation. On any drug, and so to have this energy <coughs> one must first understand, it seems to me, how we dissipate energy. We shall go into it step by step, and please, as we said the other day, the speaker is only a mirror. He is voicing what, I hope, is the problem of each one of us. And therefore you are not actually hearing a series of words or ideas, but actually listening to yourselves, actually observing yourselves, not in terms of what the speaker or of another formulates, but rather observing the actual state of one's own confusion, one's own lack of energy, misery, this sense of utter hopelessness, and so on. <coughs> As we are saying, we need a great deal of energy. <clears throat> which is not dependent on any stimulation. If we are dependent on any stimulation, that very stimulation makes the mind dull, not acute, sensitive. The more you take the drug, LSD or other forms of drugs, you may temporarily find enough energy to see things very, very clearly. But one reverts to one's former state and therefore you are dependent on that drug more and more and more. So all stimulations, whether of the church or of a drink or of a drug or of the speaker, any form of stimulation will inevitably bring about a, a dependence and that dependence prevents you from seeing clearly for yourself and therefore having the vital energy. So any form of dependence on any stimulation is lessening of the quickness 
vitality of the mind. And we all depend, unfortunately, on something. It may be on a relationship or reading an intellectual book or having formulated certain ideas and ideologies. Or seeking various forms of solitude, isolation, denial, resistances. <coughs> These obviously distort and <coughs> dissipate energy. So one has to become aware on what one is dependent. So one has to find out why one depends on anything at all, psychologically. I don't mean technologically or depending on the milkman, but psychologically why do we depend? What is involved in dependence? Because we are investigating together this question of what dissipates, deteriorates, distorts energy. And that energy which we need so vitally to understand the many problems. So, what is it on which we depend, whether it's a person, a book, a church, a priest, an ideology, or a drink or a drug, various forms which each one of us has, subtly or very obviously, why do we depend? And what is the, why this urge to depend? Please, I hope we are taking the journey together. You are not waiting for me to tell you the causes of your dependence, but rather in inquiring together we will both discover, and therefore that discovery will be yours, and hence being yours, it will give you vitality. Does the cause of, the, of a dependence free the mind from dependence? You understand my question? I discover for myself I depend on something, an audience, which will stimulate me, and therefore I need that audience. Please follow this. I derive from the audience, addressing a large group of people, a, a kind of energy. And therefore, I depend on that audience, on the people, whether they agree or disagree. 
the more they disagree, the more vitality one has. Then there's a battle. But if the audience agrees, then it becomes a very empty, shallow thing. So I depend. Why? My question is, by discovering the cause of my dependence, will I be free of that dependence? Go into it slowly with me, please. That is, I discover that I need an audience, because it, it's a very stimulating thing to address people. Now, why? Why do I depend? Because in myself I am shallow. In myself I have nothing. In myself I have no source, which is always full, rich, vital, which is moving, living. In myself I am enormously poor. So I depend. I have discovered that, the cause. Now, will the discovery of the cause free, me, free the mind from being dependent? You are, you, you are following this? I hope. Or the cause, the discovery of the cause is merely intellectual. It is not a discovery. It's merely a, a discovery of a formula. Right? It's an intellectual investigation. And the intellect has found the cause which makes the mind dependent. Now, the discovery of that cause through the intellect, through rationalization, through analysis, will that free the mind from being dependent? Obviously, it doesn't. Right? So the mere intellectual discovery of a cause does not free the mind from being dependent on something which will give it a stimulation. No, a mere intellectual acceptance, an acceptance of an idea or an emotional acquiescence to an ideology. So what frees the mind from dependence is seeing the totality of this whole structure. The whole structure of stimulation, dependence, seeing, the, seeing that mere intellectual discovery of a cause of dependence does not free the mind from dependence, seeing the total structure. Yeah. Seeing the whole structure and nature of stimulation and dependence, and how, the, how that dependence makes the mind stupid, dull, inactive, seeing the totality of it, alone frees the mind. Hmm? Right? Can we proceed from there? Anastha, madam, Anastha. No. 
do I see a part of the picture, a detail, or do I, do I see the whole picture? This is very important to ask ourselves because we see things in fragments. Right? Because we think in fragments, and all thinking is in fragments. So I must inquire into the nature of what it means to see totally. You understand? Can my mind, please follow this, which has always functioned in fragments, as a nationalist, as an individualist, as the collective, as the Catholic, as a German, Russian, French, or as an individual caught in a technological society, functioning in a specialized activity, and so on and on and on, break everything broken up in fragments. The good opposed to the evil, hate and love, anxiety and freedom, always thinking in duality, in comparison, in competition, in comparing. So such a mind, functioning in fragments, cannot see the whole. I mean, if I, as a Hindu, I am not a Hindu, or an Indian, which I'm not, if I look at the world from my little window as the Hindu, believing in certain dogmas, rituals, traditions, brought up in a certain culture and so on and on and on, obviously I don't see the whole of man, of mankind. So, to see something totally, whether it is a tree or a cloud or my relationship or any activity that I do, to see the totality of something, the mind must be free from all fragmentation and the very nature of fragmentation is the center from which I am looking. Are you following all this? The background, the culture, as the Catholic, as the Protestant, as the Communist, as the Socialist, as my family opposed, you follow? So as long as I am looking at life from a particular point of view or from a particular experience which I have cherished, which I have gathered, which I have stored up, which is my background, which is the me, I cannot see the totality. then it's not a question of how am I to get rid of fragmentations. I hope you're following on this. Our invariable, invariable question would be, how am I, who function in fragments, not to function in fragments? That's a wrong question. So, here I am. 
I am dependent psychologically on so many things. And I have discovered intellectually, verbally, anal- through analysis, I have discovered the cause of my dependence. The discovery is fragmentary. Right? Because it is an intellectual, verbal, analytical process. And therefore it is always fragmentary, which means whatever thought investigates must inevitably be fragmentary. So I can see the totality of something only when thought doesn't interfere. I see, not verbally, not intellectually, but the fact, as I see the fact of this microphone, without any like or dislike, there it is. So I see actually what is, that I am dependent. I do not want to get rid of that dependence or to be free of the cause of that dependence. I observe, and I observe <clears throat> without any centre, without any structure or the nature of thinking. So. When I observe that way, when there is an observation of that kind, I see the whole picture, not a fragment of that whole picture. So when, I, when the mind sees the whole picture, then it is free of it. The second extract is from the second question and answer meeting in Sanan, 1980, titled Dependence in Relationship. What is our present relationship with another? Not romantic, imaginative, flowery and all that superficial thing that disappears in a few minutes, but Actually, what is our relationship with another? What is your relationship with a particular person? Perhaps intimate. It involves sex, it involves a dependence on each other, comforting each other, encouraging each other, possessing each other, and therefore jealousy, antagonism, all the rest of it. And the man or the woman goes off to the office or some kind of physical work, and there he is ambitious, greedy, competitive, aggressive, to succeed and comes back home and becomes a tame, friendly, perhaps affectionate husband, wife and so on. Right? That is the actual daily of our relationship. Nobody can deny that. And we are asking, is that right relationship? We say, no, certainly not. That would be absurd to say that is right relationship. So, we say that, but continue in our own way. We say it's wrong, it's absurd to live that way, but we don't seem to be able to understand what is relationship, but accept the pattern set by society, by us, 
by ourselves, right? So we are going to find out for ourselves what is right relationship. Is there such thing? We may want it, we may wish it, may long for it, but longing, wishing doesn't bring it about. So what we have, one has to do is to go into it, seriously find out. Relationship is generally sensory, sensuous. Begin with that. Then, from sensuality, there is a companionship. A sense of dependence. On each other, which means creating a family which are which is dependent on each other. And when there is uncertainty in that dependence, the pot boils over. So we are saying. To find out what is right relationship, one has to inquire into the great dependence on each other. Why do we depend on each other? We depend on the postman, the railway, and so on. We are not talking about that. Psychologically, in our relationship with each other, why we are so dependent? Is it that we are desperately lonely? You are following all this? And is it that we don't trust anybody, even one's own husband, wife, you follow? So we hope to trust somebody, maybe my wife, my husband, but even that is rather suspicious. And also, dependence gives a sense of security. a protection against this vast world of terror. And also we say, I love you. In that love there is always the sense of being possessed and to possess. You are following with me? And when there is that situation, then arises all the conflict. Now, that is our present relationship with each other, intimate or otherwise. We create an image about each other and cling to that image. Then Are we on the right track? And so uh, one realizes the moment you are tied to a person, tied to an idea, tied to a concept, corruption has begun. Mm, that is the thing to realize. And we don't want to realize that. You understand this? If I am tied to you, an audience, friends and so on, 
I'm then dependent on you to give me encouragement, to fulfil myself talking to you. thereby encouraging vanity, all that follows, which is corruption. So can I, can we live together without being tied? Without being dependent on each other? psychologically. So unless you find this out, you will always live in conflict, because life is relationship. Right? So can we objectively, without any motive, observe the consequences of attachment and let it go immediately. Attachment is not the opposite of detachment. You understand? Please give your mind to the let your brain work. I am attached and I struggle to be detached, and therefore I create the opposite. But there is no opposite, there is only what I have, which is attachment. I don't know if you follow all this. The moment I have created the opposite, conflict comes into being. But there is only the fact of attachment, not detachment, pursue detachment. Only the fact that I am attached and I see the whole consequences of that attachment, in which actually there is no love. And can, can that attachment end? Not pursue detachment. You have understood this? So, please follow this further. The mind has been trained, educated to create the opposite. The brain has been conditioned, educated, trained to observe what is and to create its opposite. I am violent, but I must not be violent, and therefore there is conflict. Right? Do you see this? But when I observe only violence, the nature of it, how it arises and so on and so on, observe, not analyze, observe, then there is only that and not the other. Right? So you totally eliminate conflict of the opposite. I am helping this, we are talking about living a life without conflict. We are pointing how it, it, is, it can be done and should be done, must, if one wants to live in it. Only deal with what is. Everything is not. You understand this? I am angry. Don't say I should not be. Remain, understand the nature of anger. 
or the nature of greed and so on and so on. So you eliminate totally the, the quarrel, the struggle between the opposites. And when one lives that way, and it's possible to live that way, so completely remain with what is, not try to suppress it, go beyond it, escape from it, then what is with us away? You experiment with it. You understand what I'm saying? Oh, no. Look, sir, my son is dead. My son is dead. I am attached to that son. I put all my hope in that son. I want to fulfill through the sun. And unfortunately, some accident takes place, he is gone. And I shed tears, loneliness, despair, the shock of it. Then I run away from it, right? I go to a church, read escapes, but whereas if I remain completely with the fact that he's gone, and I'm lonely because I have depended on him. I have never understood this sense of isolation. I have escaped from it all my life. So when I remain with what is, then I can go into it fully, completely, and go beyond it. You understand? Please, sir, do it. As we said the other day, we are, this is a serious talk, serious gathering, not for casual visitors, casual curiosity, casual criticism. But one must criticize, one must doubt. Not what the speaker is saying, but begin to doubt all that you, you are clinging to. And then doubt what the speaker is. Don't begin to doubt what the speaker says. What he is saying is pointing out to yourself. So, when there is the freedom in relationship, which doesn't mean to do what you like. That's obviously what everybody is doing. If I don't like the present woman, I chain go off with another woman. And the agony of divorce and all that business. Whereas if I really understood the nature of relationship, which can only exist when there is no attachment, when there is no image about each other, mm. then there is real communion with each other. The third extract is from the second question and answer meeting at Brockwood Park in 1985, titled Where do we draw the line of dependency? When you are with a close friend or relative, 
psychologically, inwardly, there is all this pressure going on between the two. <coughs> you know all this, I don't have to tell you. Always trying to do something about the other, attacking subtly, physically, or through innuendo, or through subtle word gesture, you're always trying to push the other into a certain pattern. Right? This is common, isn't it? Now the questioner says, what is one to do? I'm living with you in the same house, and you are bombarding me, I'm bombarding you, not only with words and gesture, but even a look, a feeling of irritation and so on. How will you, what will you do not to be wounded, not to be pushed around psychologically? You may depend on that person financially. You may depend on that person for various psychological reasons. And the moment you depend, you become a slave, right? The moment you are attached, then you are a goner. Don't look, if I may suggest, at somebody else, but let's look at ourselves. If I am attached to you, you as the audience, then I am lost. Then I depend on you for my satisfaction, comfort, reputation, for my physical well-being too. But if I don't depend on you, I have to find out why I don't depend on you. That means, not only on you, I don't depend on anything. I want to find out it's true. I may not show it to my close relative. I want to find out for myself whether it is possible living in the same room, same house, husband, wife, relative, and so on, to be totally impregnable, not build a wall around oneself. That's fairly simple. You understand? I can build a wall around myself and be polite about it, soft about it. I'd say very affectionate, but it's still a wall. That means limitation. So can is it possible for me to live vulnerably? Go on, think it out, says. And yet not be wounded. Highly sensitive, not be in any way, responding according to my attachment. You understand? Go on, sir, think it out. And if one is dependent on another financially, that becomes rather dangerous. Most of us are in this position. Do you want me to go on with this? If I'm dependent financially on you, God forbid I'm not, but if I am dependent on you, what happens between us? You then 
have the, the whip in your hand. Not only financially, but go further into it. Is it possible to live with another on, but on whom I am financially dependent? I know I am dependent because I can't do anything else. Right? I can't start a new career. If I am quite young, I could probably do it. But if I am 60, 50 or even 70 or 90, then you can't do new, start a new career. So what, then what shall I do? God said, I'm not. What will you do? So, where do I draw the line of dependency? You understand my question? You understand my question? Psychologically, I won't depend. That's not for myself. I won't depend on anybody or on anything or on any past experience or all the rest of that rubbish. I, there is no dependence. But if one is dependent financially, where do I draw the line so that being rather oldish, you say, sorry, I, I have to put up with it, right? I have to put up with it, I can't start a new game. So, how far how deep is that line? You understand my question? Is it just superficial? You understand? Or the line has great depth. Obviously, very superficial. No, oh, I don't mind. Right? So what is important in this question is, if I, if I understand, if one understands it rightly, freedom. Freedom is absolutely necessary. But I depend on the milkman, on the supermarket. Postman and so on. Otherwise, psychologically, I don't depend. I must be very clear on this. So I draw the line very, very superficially without any depth. The fourth extract is from the second question and answer meeting at Brockwood Park in 1980, titled Depending on Others to Understand. I have been a member of the Gurdjieff group or other groups. I find it has given me a background to better understand what you are saying. Should I continue to, in such a group to possibly help others as I was helped? Or does such a group make for fragmentation? This extraordinary idea of helping others. As though you have got extraordinary comprehension, beauty, love, truth, and the whole world of order and that great immense sense of wholeness. With that you want to... If you have that, you don't talk about helping others. Right? But first of all, why do we want to belong to something? Why 
belonging, belong to some sect, some group, some religious body. Why? Is it because it gives us strength? It gives, it gives one great strength if you are a British and living in this country, to feel that you are Britain, or in Russia, or in China, or in India. Is it that we cannot stand alone? The word alone means all one. Is it that we need encouragement? We need somebody to tell us well, this is the right way. And the question says, uh, as I belong to certain groups, they have helped me to understand you. Understand what? Me? Do please look at it. Understand what we are talking about. Do you need interpreters to understand what we are talking about? To be kind, to love, to have no sense of nationality. Does it need anybody to tell you? Why do we depend on others, whether the others be the image in a church or in a temple or a mosque or the preacher or the psychologist or anybody? Why do we depend on others? <coughs> If we do depend on others psychologically, we become second-hand people, which we are. We are. We have. The whole history of mankind is in us. Whole story of mankind is not in books. There is the outer things, but the whole history is here. And we don't know how to read that. And if we could read it, and to read it, you're not the reader. You understand? You are the book. But when you read the book as you know, as a reader, it has no meaning. But if you are the book and, are, and the book is showing you, telling you the story, and you are not telling the story, but the book is telling, then you will not depend on a single person. Then one will be a light to oneself. But we are all waiting for the match of another fire of another. And perhaps that's why you're all here. And that's where the tragedy lies. Because we cannot see clearly for ourselves. And before we help others, we have to see clearly, for God's sake. It's like then it will be blind leading the blind. The final extract in this episode is from the second question and answer meeting in Madras, 1985, titled Independence is Necessary. I have, the speaker has no, K has no closed circles, right? 
That's the first thing to establish very clearly. Right? He has no close circle around him, the disciples. <laughs> Which is a horror to the speaker to have disciples. Because generally disciples destroy the teacher. You may laugh at it, but it's a fact. So there is no close circle. I would walk out of it tomorrow if there was such a thing. And I really mean it. Because independence is necessary. And it's only through independence there can be cooperation. You understand? Know, cooperation is immensely important in life. We either cooperate for our own profit, for our own self interest, or we cooperate around a person because we all worship him. And it becomes personal idolatry, which is an abomination. And cooperation, which is to work together, do things together, can never take place unless you are each one is completely independent. I know this goes. Contrary to everything, you cooperate with the government, you cooperate with the guru, you cooperate with the policeman, you cooperate with your governor or the chief minister, and blah blah, all the bosses, and so on. And they all destroy your independence. It's only when you are really independent you can I can work with you and you can work with me. That means we must both be free to cooperate. You are not my boss, I'm not your boss. You understand only this all? Oh Lord, all right. It's up to you. <laughs> 